So here's a little insight into the way I kind of approach the preaching task. Um, I'm scheduled to, to preach for today, so on Monday morning, I sat down with the texts for today and uh, decided which text I was going to preach on and how I wanted to approach that. But I, I tell you that this week, it's one of those times where you look at the lessons that are appointed for the day and you just kind of scratch your head. I don't know if, if you remember uh, back in the, like the 60s and 70s, uh, there were some odd names for some of the Sundays, especially in the legend season. Uh, Hexagesima sun Sunday, Quinquagesima Sunday, and then there was Whit Sunday. I've decided that after looking at all the options for the text for the day, it should be Downer Sunday. <laughs> I read the Old Testament lesson that you have on the back of your bulletins, and it's from Amos. And God says he's going to take a plumb, plumb, plumb bob and set it next to his people, and he's not going to... Basically, he says, I'm not putting up with any of their garbage anymore. <laughs> end of story. And at the end, that's like, thus saith the Lord. Um, and so there are options. And this particular Sunday, there's an option for, for the Old Testament lesson from 2 Samuel. So I thought, well, let's go take a look at that. Uh, well, so the story in 2 Samuel, I don't know if you remember the, your Old Testament stories, but... You might remember that Saul at one time thought it would be a great idea to take the Ark of the Covenant into battle. Apparently, um, he, uh, he, he had the same misunderstanding that the folks who put together the Indiana Jones movie had, that this was some sort of uh, you know, near nuclear weapon, right? Well, guess what? They lost it in battle to the Philistines. Uh, the story continues. The Philistines had it for a while in the, in the palace or the, the temple of one of their pagan gods. And, um, and the, the consequence of that, this is kind of fun, uh, the, in the Old Testament, normally says that God afflicted them with boils. Well, one of the, one of the both blessings and curses of learning Hebrew is that, that you know what that word is. It's not really, well, it's sort of boils, but actually it's hemorrhoids. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. <laughs> and, and so they said, you know, apparently they said, we'd like to sit down, so let's get rid of this thing. Uh, so they put it on an ox cart and sent it away, and it wandered off to this guy's house. And David says, let's bring it to Jerusalem. So they get out of the guy's house, and I think his name's Abinadab, and he's got two sons. One of them is Uzzah. And they put the, the Ark of the Covenant on the, the ox cart, and it's heading off, and the ox stu oxen stumble. And Uzzah reaches out to steady the Ark of the Covenant so it won't smash to the ground. And God is offended and strikes him dead. Everybody's upset. Yeah, like, I'm still like reading up, okay, where's the good news? I want to bring some gospel good news. It strikes us a dead. Well, it, it stays in, the, in this place for a while, and, and, uh, and the guy who owns that property is doing well, so David, David decides, okay, now it's time to bring it to Jerusalem. So, so he brings up to Jerusalem, he's dancing and, and, and jumping up and down. He's wearing a linen ephod, uh, in ephod, gown and ephod, and, and there's this little passage at the end that said, Michael, who was Saul's youngest daughter and David's wife, and there's a lot of three stories there, um, Michael sees him doing this, and she despises him. That's how the Old Testament lesson ends. Later on, you find out that apparently she despises him because he failed to wear undergarments. Okay, so, so now it's Monday at like 1045, and I'm like, okay, what are we going to do here? Oh, gospel lesson, right? So we're at the end of which we say the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Okay, so you look at the gospel lesson, and it's, uh, so King Herod heard the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Uh, who, does he, who does Herod think that John, uh, Jesus is? Herod, superstitious guy, says, John the Baptist, who I killed, has been raised from the dead. And the rest of the gospel lesson is the story, the recounting of the story of John the Baptist beheading. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, you begin to wonder, okay, there are all those people who talk about the Bible being a violent book, and you know, all the evil that's perpetrated in there, you know, don't share this with your children, and, and pretty much if you ever went to Sunday school, you don't learn the lessons, the whole lesson, you'll learn kind of a nice little story, and then, then some people get scandalized by all the violence that's there, and all the craziness that's there in the Bible, in the Bible. I grant you, there's a tremendous amount of violence and other oddities in the Bible. But you know, that's one of the things about the Bible that I find particularly engaging. 
Nowhere throughout is there any effort to clean things up. I mean, the Bible's been around for a couple thousand years. And very early on, the, veriest, the, the very earliest manuscripts available have these stories. It's like, from the very beginning, it was this way, and no one said, you know what? Well, no one until Thomas Jefferson decided to do his thing with it, that he took basically a black marker to the Bible, and I don't like that, took it out. Anyway, but nobody in the right mind <laughs> ever decided, you know, we should take some of this stuff out of the Bible. I think there's a reason for that. Quite frankly, because it's simply honest about who we human beings are. The one thing, we have a really hard time being. Think of the very first story of the Bible, not after creation. Adam and Eve, they're there in the garden. The serpent comes, deceives them. When God comes and asks them what's going on, they can't tell the truth. They blame somebody else. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. That's what we human beings want to do. We want to make ourselves look good, better. I told you about the, my, my first experience of, uh, of uh, you know, being part of a, a sermon, the children's sermon at the church I was growing up in. I really wish the pastor would have warned me ahead of time what he was doing, because it scared the heck out of me to have to stand in front of everybody. My parents were in like the second row on the right as I'm looking at them, and there's other adults who were in the congregation. The pastor's asking me questions about stuff that I did. I didn't want to admit it. I would rather it stayed hidden. Are we on the same page? <laughs> yeah. It's something about this warped and broken human nature that we want to make ourselves look better than we are. Because we are all afraid. We're all afraid that others will think less of us, and deep down or in some dark place, in honestly everyone's mind is this suspicion that God doesn't like me very much. It, probably because frequently, when we look at ourselves, we don't like ourselves very much. We see our deception, we see our pride, we see the times when we've just flat out hurt somebody, and not even for good reason. And we're afraid of what's in us, that old darkness that has infected the human race. So I've looked at the two Old Testament options, and I've looked at the Gospel lesson option, and at this point I'm still wondering, where is there some good news? Well, there's one more lesson left, and it is the Epistle lesson. The Epistle lesson is always, except during during uh, the season of Easter, when it's sometimes from the book of Acts, the epistle lesson is always one of those letters to the very earliest Christians. That, that early group of persecuted minority that, that didn't understand uh, much of what we're able to understand today, that didn't have the Bible as we ha have it today. They're trying to figure this out as they're, as they're going on, along, and they're just half a step, many of them, out of paganism, trying to figure out how God could love them. They're used to the old system where, it, where you did the right things to make amends. You, you, you slaughtered animals. You sometimes slaughtered people to make it right so that, so that you could be better so that when God or the gods looked at you, they wouldn't look at you with wrath. And Paul, that Christian apostle, says words that to them and to us are extraordinarily important. And finally, on this Sunday, are some gospel. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place. And he goes on from there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. And when he writes us, he includes himself, and he, nobody says about himself. He talks about how in his former way of Judaism, he was proceeding beyond all of his contemporaries and all the awful stuff that he was doing. You might remember that he was the one holding the cloaks of the guys who were stoning Stephen. And he went to Damascus to throw Christians in prison and perhaps, if possible, to execute some. This is a violent man, or was a violent man. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us 
in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And he says the same to some of them who had very dark things in their past. He says those same words, God speaks those same words to us who we've all agreed don't like to have our secrets revealed or our sins on display. God blessed us. God blessed us because he loves us. And that's why the Bible can be so full of these horrible stories that make you wonder what in the world is going on and why in the world that God would ever want to save any of these people. And then you put that next to us today and our failures and our pride and our anger and wrath the hurtful things that we say and do. And it's the same story. But it's the same good news. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us in Christ with his life and death and resurrection so that we might live different, so that we might live hopeful, so we, we might live confident that God loves us and everyone in this benighted planet. I'm much older than I was when I stood up there in front of uh, that church in Southern California and, and had those sticky notes on me. This one still wore in a white robe and still knowing that that white robe is not about me but a symbol for all of us of what Christ has done for us. That in Christ, all those things are covered and washed away. In Christ, we are all God's beloved children. In Christ, we are witnesses to resurrection and new life. May God bless you in Christ with every spiritual blessing and make you know that you are His own. In Jesus' name, amen.